Okay, my name is John. I'm the uh, head of R&D, uh, culinary R&D of Remy Robotics. We're a food startup based here in Barcelona. Um, and I'd like to thank Harbour Space for having me come and do this talk. What we're going to be talking about today is... It's on the next slide. <laughs> I will do this each time. Eh? Hey, now it works. Maybe just see. Now it works. Okay, lovely. So, like I said, I'm the head of culinary R&D at Remy Robotics. We're a food tech startup here in Barcelona. And what we, what I'm going to talk about today, basically, is three things, but they are quite large things. So we're going to try to fit a lot of information into a quite small amount of uh, time. We're going to be talking about basically food design, food design aesthetics and social movements and how they're all connected. And we're going to be talking about problems in the food system that can be solved with technology. So the first thing is, what is food design? Food design is the basically everything that has to do with food, everything that you think about that has to do with food and drink has been designed at some point by somebody. It has come to exist either by uh, environmental and techno technological forces or it's been consciously thought about by somebody else. And these are, these are some good examples. So this is a honey, a honey spoon that you pick up and you're supposed to twirl it. And if you twirl it, the honey doesn't drip all over the place. So if you're picking up honey with a spoon, the honey gets everywhere and it's super sticky. But if you use the honey spoon and you keep spinning it, the honey has enough uh, viscosity to stay in the spoon. This is a very clever design thing, but it was invented by like the ancient Egyptians many, many, many years ago. Other things that we don't really think about so much are like Kentucky Fried Chicken. Kentucky Fried Chicken is one of the greatest examples of food technology design in the world. They invented the pressure deep fryer that allows them to fry chicken twice as fast as anybody else. And they invented a dehydrator warming machine that allows their chicken to stay crispy forever. That's why there's Kentucky Fried Chicken is the most popular restaurant in the entire world because they invented these two very important pieces of technology that allow them to give their chicken everywhere in the world. And then cheese, obviously, is a very big deal. And other things like blast freezing, flash freezing, freezing things very rapidly and very quickly to keep their organoleptic properties in, intact. And this kind of high technology thing seems, seems like the logical thing when you, when you talk about food technology, you, you think you're talking about machinery and uh, software, but also food technology can be something like Hamon, and Hamon is, is a very complex piece of technology. First, you have to breed pigs. Then you have to feed a pig exclusively acorns its entire life. Then you have to, to slaughter it, salt it in such a way and hang it in a room that this entire, for two or 300 years, has been hanging ham and the microbiology on the outside stops it from spoiling. So that's another type of food technology that's, that's maybe not as uh, obvious when you think about food tech, but it is food tech. And then base, the basic, if you go way down to the, the very, very beginning, food technology is the, is the reason we exist as a species. We have a very big brain and we have a very small mouth. And it's, if you look at our closest ancestor here, our closest cousin, let's say, he has a very small brain and a very big mouth. And they spend 12 hours a day eating in order to get enough nutrients to operate their body. We spend, we can spend like an hour a day eating if we need to because we cook our food. And the fact that we can cook our food allows us to have the brains that we do. So food technology actually predates humans. Before we knew how to do fire, we were not humans. After they invented fire, Australopithecus becomes human. So without food technology, there is no, there is no people. There are no people, I should say. The other thing is that food technology is the basic reason, not only for the existence of humans as a species, but food technology existence for humans as a civilization. You have the ability to culture wheat. So you stop being a hunter gatherer and you start planting wheat and you start doing agriculture. This kind of thing is a food technology. But it wasn't until we made the leap into fermenting the food technology that we were able to survive off of wheat. So if you eat porridge, which is in the middle here, you see you have wheat, you have porridge in your bread, right? Wheat is the raw stuff. Bread is if you mix it with water and you cook it and you eat it. And bread is when you ferment it and you cook. If you eat nothing but porridge, you will die of malnutrition in like not, not a very long time. But you can live for years and years happily, just basically just eating bread with a few little supplements. And the reason for that is because of the fermentation technology that we've learned how to, we've learned how to uh, control. The other thing that's the reason for civilization, if you go to the East, is wine and alcohol and the ability to ferment things into alcohol. If you, have, if you are an agrarian society, or rather a pre-agrarian society, you gather a bunch of uh, wine, you gather a bunch of rice, put it in a bucket, and it turns into wine, and you try it, and everyone has a really good time, you will probably start planting 
more more rice, making more uh, or wheat in the case of bread. So while rice doesn't isn't fermented in the same way that bread is, you can still survive off of a diet of primarily rice if you supplement it with fermented products like fermented soybeans. Then this is the basic example of ancient food technology going a long time back. Fermentation is the oldest food technology. This is a, this is a wheel of cheese that was discovered in Egypt. It's 5,000 years old and they didn't eat it. This is a fermentation vessel that's basically remained unchanged for years and years in Korea. And of course, breeding, breeding of the three staple crops. You can identify this one, I assume, is wheat, this one is rice, and this one is maize for corn. And these are the, the drivers of uh, our entire global society. It's basically these three crops. And these have been selectively bred. Corn was not found in a giant ear of corn. Corn was bred from a, a specific little type of grass. But we will talk, we will talk about corn later because it's actually a very interesting story that has more to do with nuclear war than uh, agriculture. And then for wild food, you have to invent bows and arrows. You have to invent hooks. And then once you have bows and arrows, you can not only kill animals, you can start killing each other. And then we can go into a different level of society. Then you have fire control. The control of fire is entirely dependent on where you are in the, in the ecosystem. If you, we can take two examples. If you take the wok, why the wok is round versus why the European pan is flat is a really good example because if you are in Southern China and you have a lot of people uh, and your prim primary car crop is rice, you have rice stocks. So your primarily fuel source is rice stocks and rice stocks burn really, really hot for a really short amount of time. And so there's no reason to cook things for a long period of time because you're using dried rice stocks. So I should be clear that the round bottom is the, the first part. It has to develop later into a, into a flat pot. And why does it develop into a flat pot? Is because if you go to the, somewhere where there's a lot of trees and not so many people, you've, then your fuel source is trees. So you can cut down the trees, you can start a fire for a really long time, you can put a piece of metal over it, and then now you have a flat surface, you need to start inventing flat pots and putting flat pots. That's one of the, the, one of the changes, let's say, in depending on fuel use and fuel source. That can affect not only that doesn't even affect just the technology that affects everything you're cooking everything you cook in a flat pot you have to use different techniques for it you have to use different ingredients for it you think about chinese cooking versus western cooking or i should say southern chinese cooking versus northern european cooking uh everything in the chinese cooking is chopped up much much smaller because it cooks quicker and if your food is all chopped up smaller because it cooks quicker you have to invent a knife so this knife over here goes all the way back to 3000 BC, they have knives like this. Whereas the Western knife, because the Westerners don't cut their food, the Western knife is, is a product of uh, the industrial revolution. The knives that we had in the West were mostly for killing each other um, and stabbing things, not for pit, not for kitchen. Kitchen knife as an idea come from China. And why does it come from China? It's because that's where you cut the food, because that's where your fuel source is quick and that's where your pots are round. It's also why you have chopsticks. A really good example of ancient food technology that I like is this thing right here. This is a yak chal, if I'm pronouncing that. Yak chal. Thank you. <laughs> you know what it is? Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Explain, explain. Uh, so basically, it's an old uh, way of keeping ice throughout the summer. Uh, basically, if water rains down and then it's. Sorry. Uh, water rains. When, when it rains during the winter, it, it's really cold down there, so it gets frozen, and then you can keep your food for quite a long time there. Exactly, it's an ice machine. It's a massive ice machine. It uses uh, air and surface temperatures to create ice in the bottom. And it's cooled by constant wind that blows through in, in, in Persia. And this is why the inventors of ice cream uh, is Persia. So Persia has, has the oldest tradition of ice cream. This is why ice cream exists in Persia because of the existence of this. There's a very funny story during the second crusade, I think, King Richard was in Jerusalem and they were having a parlay with Saladin. And uh, Saladin brought him ice cream and, uh, and, I, and like an iced beverage in the middle of summer in Jerusalem, just as kind of a, it's like a little show off situation. <laughs> like you guys can make ice. Okay, and that, so that's ancient technology. So we think of ancient technology as very fun, as very, 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 uh, very old, not as quick, not as useful as our technology, but it can do for many amazing things. Now, post-industrial food technology is a different story. This is when I will talk about the corn. So post-industrial food technology of canned food, which we're all very familiar with here in, in Spain. Canned food was actually invented in a French technology competition. Napoleon really wanted to invade Russia. Um, and he had the biggest army ever created at that time in, in the world. And he wanted to get to Moscow. 
But in order to get to Moscow, he needed to have a supply chain. And to keep his supply chain fed, he had to invent a way of preserving food. So he gave a prize of some large amount of money in whatever the old Frank, Franks, maybe. And the person that came up with the idea was canning. And they came up with canning, pasteurizing inside a can. And that allowed Napoleon to go to Moscow. And then obviously it didn't go that well from after that. But they did invent, they did invent canning. And then white bread in a square shape is a product of industrial technology. The trains that were going across the United States um, and the UK, they needed to feed people in the trains and they needed to feed people in the quickest and easiest way possible. So they wanted to use bread. And bread normally is a big, huge blob like this, like an unshaped loaf. So what they started doing was shaping the bread into kind of cubes, kind of rectangles. And then that way you could bake a lot of them in one plate. And that's why the bread that you see for sandwich bread is square, is because of trains, because that's the way the train was designed and that's the way the oven was designed. Then you have uh, white rice. White rice we think of as a very, very like very typical East Asian uh, dish, but in reality, it wasn't until the 20th century that white rice became available to everyone. If you think about the amount of labor that goes into getting a rice kernel, threshing the rice kernel, getting the brown piece off of the rice kernel and then polishing it a little bit, it's a huge amount of labor. So white rice used to be a very, very luxury product, but now thanks to mechanical automation, <laughs> Uh, and industrial industrial design, you can have white rice for everyone all the time. And the fridge, obviously, I don't think we need to say why the fridge has been such a big deal. Everyone understands why the fridge is a big deal. And the freezer as well. And then corn, as I said, I was going to explain. So there was this thing happening in the 1950s, 1960s in the United States, where they were very interested in the effects of nuclear radiation on crops. And they saw that when they bombed a place in New Mexico, there would be a bunch of mutated plants and things like that. And so they, they thought, well, if we can selectively expose plants to radiation, we can then choose the mutations that work the best for us. So they did that. And the result was sweet corn. The corn that we eat today is the, the really, really big one, the really super, super sweet one. This is actually was invented using this uh, radio, radioactive testing, which basically means putting it quite close to where they're going to blow up a bomb and then getting back, I, I guess. And then coming back later and picking it up and see, and then growing it and seeing what mutations happened and then selectively breeding those mutations. So, yeah, that's quite interesting. But the main, main driver, the biggest thing that's happened, you don't need to worry about reading books, but the main, main driver that's happened in the 20th century is the, is, the, is the emergence of a global food system. We no longer are in a food system that is dependent only in, in this example in Catalonia. Uh, we're dependent on everyone all over the place. It's a huge amount of logistics. It's, it's a global situation, right? And a good example of this, how globalization affects food is uh, iron deficiency and anemia in Southeast Asia. So in the, in let's say in the sixties, there was a big peak, a big rise, steep rise in uh, anemia and iron deficiency in Southeast Asia. And everyone was really confused as to why this was happening because what's happened in Southeast Asia recently. Why has everyone suddenly got an iron deficiency? <laughs> and so they started looking into it and they looked, if you look at these are the traditional metal cooking pots in Southeast Asia. And this was specifically done in Cambodia. These are, these are Cambodian pots here. Uh, whereas the Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese community would use these. And this is what they used to be. And they used to be made out of iron, which is very important. And they realize now that everyone is using these. In the seventies, it became much more cheap and much more easy and much more affordable to get aluminum pots or aluminium pots. And the result was everyone started cooking in aluminium pots and stopped using iron because iron was expensive and iron would break and aluminium was just so much better. But you needed the iron in the pots to supplement the diet, that's the Southeast Asian diet, because you're eating rice and fish mostly. And rice and fish just doesn't have any iron in it. So you end up with anemia and you end up with uh, vitamin deficiency. So the solution was a food design group came up with this guy, which is a little cute fish made of iron that you put in your cooking pot which puts iron in your aluminum cooking pot, which then puts iron into your food and then people no longer have an iron deficiency. So this is quite popular in Cambodia where there was a big government push to like get everyone to buy a fish, put a fish in your pot, put a fish in your pot. And everyone started doing it and the anemia and iron deficiency went down. But you needed to market it, you need to, you need to show it. But that's just in the last 20 years. That's the kind of thing that food design and food technology really changes and affects. Another interesting highlight of modern food design is the Pringle. The Pringle is actually one of the most uh, mathematically designed foods on the planet. It was invented by a guy who, who really didn't like uh, potato chips to crumble. 
Uh, he hated opening a bag and having crumbly potato chips. This was before we figured out how to inject gas into potato chips. Nowadays, we inject gas into them. It's why when you get a bag of potato chips this big, there's this many in them, because that bag is stopping them from, from breaking. But pre all that, he invented, first of all, invented that idea by creating the Pringles can to be a vacuum. But because he had to pull a vacuum on it, it had to be a very rigid shape. So that's why it's this rigid tube, so that he can pull a vacuum and put a lid on it and keep them crispy. And the other problem was potatoes don't want to fit in this in this, uh, this tube, so you have to invent a new shape. So the shape that he invented is actually a hyperbolic parabola, and Pringles checks their shape of every single one of their, uh, their chips with uh, one of the most advanced uh, AI systems in food manufacturing, is every Pringles chip is mathematically perfect to be a hyperbolic parabola. There's very, very little change in Pringles. It's also that they changed the entire recipe to be potato starch plus dehydrated potatoes to make it really crispy, all in the quest, just so when you pick it up, it's crunchy. And uh, yeah, so it's it seems like a frivolous thing, but a huge amount of research went into, the, went into Pringles. Other highlights of modern food design, and this is Samantha Cristobetti, and, and uh, she was the first Italian in space. And before, when, when she basically, when she got to the ISS, she was very upset to find that there was no espresso in space. All of the Russians and Americans were completely happy to be drinking uh, instant coffee, but uh, Samantha Christovetsky was like, no, absolutely not. We need espresso. So she teamed up with Lavazza and invented a zero gravity espresso machine, which is, if you think about how espresso works, to do espresso without the benefit of gravity is, uh, is an incredibly difficult process. There's a lot of valves, a lot of compression. And it's became known to what now you know as the Aeropress. So the Aeropress is the descendant of the ISS, Samantha's uh, zero gravity espresso machine. Then the other highlight of modern food design, I would say is Soviet champagne. So in 1936, there was a change in the USSR's opinion about champagne. Previous to 1936, you thought that champagne was a little bit of a bourgeois, a bourgeois thing that people didn't really need to drink to get rid of, we got rid of champagne after the revolution and so on. But then they changed their mind and, and they thought that actually everyone should have champagne. Instead of not, not giving anyone champagne, let's give everyone champagne. So they had to invent a new way of making champagne. The new way of making champagne was invented by this guy, Anton Shrilov. And this is his method. It's still today called the Soviet methods for champagne making. And it's one of the two largest champagne ways of manufacturing champagne in the world. You use, you use basically an initial fermentation tank. You clarify it with a biogenerator. You uh, put it into a chilling, and then you you uh, carbonate it all at once. Do you know how to make normal champagne? Probably I should say how to make normal champagne first, and then it will make more sense. So normally when one makes champagne, or, or kava in our case, right? if you go to any, there's actually, there are no kava manufacturers who use this, but there are lots of champagne manufacturers. So you go to make kava, you make some, you make some wine, normal wine, which is you get grape juice, you put it in the bucket and then let it go back. Then you put it in a bottle, and you put it in a bottle before it's finished fermenting. So it has residual sugars. And you have to put the bottle in such a way that it's inverted in a, in a uh, they have a special rack. And every, let's say four or five days, someone has to go and turn, turn the bottles around manually. And then in a couple more months, you have uh, wine with bubbles. The older the champagne, the smaller the bubbles uh, come because the, it increases in acetic acid and the fermentation slows down and the bubbles get really, really tiny. So, very, very old champagne has very, very tiny bubbles. And that's why old champagne is good. Not because it's old, but because the bubbles feel just like super great bubbles. So this was difficult to replicate, right? And so this method, much, much easier. You can do liters and liters and liters of champagne at the same time using this CO2 stabilization and infusion technique, which is basically you push a bunch of gas into the, into the product to make it, make it bubbly. And the result was Soviet champagne, which we think of as a very industrial method and not as good as the traditional champagne and so on, right? However, the best selling champagne brand in the world is Soviet style champagne. Moet and Chardon uses Soviet method champagne and they have the most, most, expensive, uh, most expensive bottles of champagne you can buy. Yeah, Prosecco is made the same way, exactly. It's basically all sparkling wine that, isn't, that doesn't say method and sestrals. Well, I mean, that, exactly. Okay, the other highlight of, of modern food design. This one is a little bit of a hot topic, we will say. Genetically modified food. Genetically modified food, I would say, is a highlight of modern food design. 
if you look at this map to the left, or my left, your right, um, everywhere in red or yellow has vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A deficiency means you get childhood blindness, you get uh, bad developmental problems. And if you can enrich a crop with vitamin A, then you can give it to all these people and they won't have vitamin A deficiency. And the way to do that is you use gene editing software and you edit the genes of the rice and you put vitamin A into the rice and the result is this golden rice. Thing. And it's one of the biggest, uh, biggest GMO crops in the world. And the GMO crops uh, that are mostly banned in a lot of countries simply by the virtue of them being GMO, right? Because we've changed them, because we've genetically modified them, people consider it bad. But the reason I think people consider it bad is not for the right reason. If you can enrich rice with vitamin A, everyone should be able to eat vitamin-rich rice all the time, right? We put fluoride in the water. So it's, it's the same thing. You're just putting vitamin A into the rice. The main problem that people have with GMOs, I think, is when you talk about GMOs, it's impossible to not talk about the company Monsanto. And what they tend to do is they tend to license their seeds. So they copyright their genetically modified seeds. And then because those seeds are copyrighted, if they end up in your field, they sue you for a million dollars and put you out of business and then buy your field and build another farm. So it's, it's a very insidious kind of cycle. So the problem really isn't genetically modified food. The problem is this kind of uh, greed and copywriting seeds. That's main, basically. Genetically modified food helps a lot. You can make foods that are resistant to insects, so you don't need to use so much insecticide and destroy the environment. You can make higher yield crops that will enable us to feed more people. And you can put vitamin A in rice and let everyone not be blind in childhood. Now, another interesting theory, that's our food technology half. This is our little piece about food technology of this talk. We're now gonna go on to more theory. Does anyone wanna ask any questions about food technology before we jump on theory? No? Any questions like, uh, how do you uh, making this uh, uh, science? Uh, Thank you. It's working, yeah? Yeah, yeah, just uh, Cool, cool. <laughs> so uh, how are you making uh, this um, uh, kind of research? To understand what should exactly you modify maybe some special techniques because i know how it works in uh, biotech but uh, never heard about uh, food changing kind of genetics or whatever so if you tell me like uh, what uh, program or how you're doing it it will be very useful thank you okay i don't know the answer to that question mostly i know that they took normal rice and they developed a version of rice that has vitamin A. I don't know the technical bio biochemical processes or biogenetic processes of how they do it, but I know they did, unfortunately, sorry. So they do a lot of cross-breeding between other varieties of rice, so. Well, that's, that's standard, that's standard uh, agriculture. That's what we've been doing for centuries. Yeah, but this is done in a laboratory instead of over decades and decades of hundreds of generations of yeah. cross-breeding, so that's, that's more scientifically done. Done. Sorry, can you can you repeat when someone says ah, something? Yeah, so what, what he said was that you do you can do because you're doing it in a lab and you're doing so many successive generations so quickly, you can do it much, much more rapidly than in the old way of doing it, which is where you harvested a little and made and you had to wait every year for a new one to come. That's basically what he said. Which isn't but he was asking about like what's the name of this pro, the program they used to do it, and I, I don't know the answer as well. But in general, it's absolutely correct. That's what genetic modification is. Okay, so. Theory. Are you familiar? The works of Michel Foucault is this uh, French social theorist who is most famous for writing about prisons, but he has a very interesting book called The Archaeology of Knowledge. And the archaeology of knowledge is the idea that within all of our knowledge, within all of our ideas, is every preceding idea that came before. So if you look into a look into an idea, within that idea, you can take it apart with archaeology and you can just and you can see where it came from, how old it is, what are the influences on it. You can do the exact same thing with food. If you take, I'm doing pan con tomate because we are, we are in Barcelona. If you look at Bar if you look at the pan con tomate, you can break it into its into its components, and you can see the history of uh, the history of Catalonia in in this dish very easily. So you have bread and fermentation, which is what we already talked about, right? It's a very ancient uh, ancient technology. It's, it's like the most important staple crop in the region. Then you have tomatoes which are interesting for two things. One, you have the Colombian exchange where tomatoes are not from Spain, right? Tomatoes are from Peru somewhere and they didn't look like this. They were tiny little almost poisonous berries that we had to, we had to, uh, we had to breed to get them to be delicious. So already you have that, but these specific tomatoes, uh, I don't know the name in English, so like the tomatoes penjar, like the hanging, hanging tomatoes, 
these have been bred selectively to last a really long time hanging. So they don't like to be sitting on the counter because they will start to go bad. But if you hang them, they will last much longer than any other tomato. They're selectively bred to, to penjot, to hang. Then olive oil, obviously, you have the largest, uh, one of the big successes of Spanish industry is the world's largest olive oil industry, the world's largest olive oil manufacturer. A lot of that's electronic, a lot of that is uh, industrial, a lot of that's machinery. So that's the modern, modern use there. And salt, obviously, it's from the sea and the refinement of salt has been the history of trade for thousands and thousands of years. You have the Roman Empire, people paying people in salt in Tarragona right here. So just by looking at these four ingredients, you see the entire history of Catalonia in a very small and easy to understand. And aloe as well. And aioli, right. This is, so that's actually, aioli is an interesting, is a contentious topic. <laughs> because if you, if you ask, uh, I used to work at the research lab in Obui, and we would research stuff. And they were 100% convinced that anything was, that was mayonnaise was invented in Catalonia. Because aioli was made, invented in Catalonia. So obviously mayonnaise is invented in Catalonia. But, you know, mayonnaise is an emulsification uh, of garlic. Aioli is, is an emulsification of oil and garlic, and you mix it up together. And a mayonnaise is oil and garlic, and you put other stuff in it, lemon juice or, or, a, or an egg or whatever. And any emulsification going back to the aioli, there's an argument for it. But... I only for sure is Catalan. I don't know about I don't know about mayonnaise. Okay. Aesthetic considerations within food design. If you want to give somebody something to eat, uh, there is a lot of aesthetic considerations you have to take into account. You have to understand how people are going to look at the food, how people are going to interact with the food. The initial thing we see, uh, the first thing we do with food is we look at it. Maybe we smell it actually. Probably we talk about smells, but it's very difficult to put smells on a slap. So we're going to talk about that thing. So if you look here, you have kind of like the 1980s, 1980s style uh, Marco Pierre White dish, which is kind of very bland, very quiet. And then you have more modern things over here with Gagan, Gagan Anad. He has a, has a restaurant in Bangkok, and he, he is, his entire menu is made of emojis. So you don't read what it is. You just get a picture of an emoji, and then you get something, and you most of it he likes to confuse people and make people like lick the plate and think it's fine. McDonald's is again the product of a sincere amount of investment in the in the aesthetic side, sincere amount of investment in the colors of things and so on. And then down here you have Chinese plating and Thai plating. Chinese plating is interesting because of the way that you eat in, in China. You don't eat an individual portion. This is designed to be viewed from the top. You sit, you look at it like this. This Chinese plating is designed to be in a table that is surrounded by many other people, and you can see it from across the table. So it has to be three D. To be three dimensional. So Chinese plating is three dimensional. This here is, a, is melon, which is also kind of a Chinese uh, plating because it's three dimensional, but this is more of a Thai, Thai style carving where the, I knew a lady who used to work at the Royal Palace in Thailand and her name was Meli. And her job at the Royal Palace in Thailand was to just carve fruit that looks like flowers and carve vegetables that looks like flowers. The king apparently will not eat anything if it's not carved to look like a flower or so I was led to believe. Uh, and so the, the, the process of carving is very, very important. So basic color theory is, is this. This is basic ideas of color. You have the very famous Klein Blue, you have Montreal, you have Picasso's Rose period and Picasso's Blue period. And by looking at Picasso's Blue period and Rose period, you get different emotional resonances. Right? This is not an art. I don't want to get too much into the art theory, but you can look and, and immediately, I don't have to explain to you how you're feeling when you see it. It's very easy to see that Blue is a little bit more depressing. A bit more mysterious. Uh, and Mondrian is here, even though he's not the most basic, because he does a lot of interplay, interplay of colors, but he does interplay of colors with a big fat border in the middle. And that border separates the colors and stops them from interacting with each other. So I, I consider Mondrian also kind of a basic color. And then Klein just paints everything blue. And in marketing, we only use basic color theory. There's no interaction of color. It's the most basic and simple understanding of color, the most visceral thing. We don't, I'm not going to go into all of these, but like red is supposed to be exciting and, uh, and, and passionate. Black is uh, refined and elegant. Brown is earthy. Uh, clear is transparent, obviously. Um, green is considered very healthy. And if you look at these, if you look at these brands, you can see already that your reactions to the colors are different. And you're not taking them in opposition to anything. You're merely taking them as red. Coca-Cola, Heinz, Tim Hortons and KFC, you know immediately what you're getting when you go in there. Just by, the, just by the color. Even if it didn't have the brand, you would know. Uh, and silver is, is very elegant and so on. 
But all of this, you, you again, I don't need to explain it to you because you intuitively know. I'm merely illustrating that you intuitively know. And this is basic color within food. Green food is healthy. Red food is spicy. Red food is rich. Green food is uh, is more is got more chlorophyll in it, so it actually is greener and it actually is probably uh, healthy, healthier for it. But this is the basic idea of color. So using you cannot use basic color theory for food. It doesn't work because food is never one color. Food is always the interaction of color. So we talk a little bit more about advanced color theory. This here is Joseph Albers uh, and Ellsworth Kelly. And you can see the difference between them and Mondrian is they don't have the big fat border in them. Right? Mondrian is separating the two colors where Albers is showing all of these different shades of green are working together simply by virtue of them being green and by virtue of them being placed in the same square as they are. He has thousands of these. And if you were to look at one part of the square, it wouldn't look the same color as if you look at it with this and this together. It, everything, everything connects and works, works together. So if you look at the same picture, we'll just put the green on the red and the red and the green. Do you see how it looks different? Do you see how it feels different? The red, the, the green vegetables on the red background, now suddenly it seems like it's a more interesting type of asparagus. Whereas before it looked like it was just kind of healthy asparagus. But now it's, it's more interesting asparagus. And that's the kind of, kind of a, a little hint at the color interaction. Within food. So if you see this example, this is chicken wings, and we just put a different color behind it. And so each of these dishes of chicken wings, you look and you think a little bit differently about the chicken, right? Which chicken wings you would order, which chicken wings would, what sauce do you think the chicken wings have on them is all affected by the color of the thing behind it. I did an experiment at one of my labs that I used to have, is we had these, we had a pill press, which is where you take, you take some starch and you can put some flavors into it and you crush it into a little pill. So you get like condensed flavors. And I experimented with dyeing all these pills different colors. And I dyed them red and pink and yellow and green and orange and whatever. And they had no flavor. And I would give them to people and I asked them to describe the flavor that they tasted. So people, we did about 100 different people and everyone was describing flavors, totally different flavors from the red pill to the blue pill to the green pill. And it was, it was exactly what you expect. Red one is spicy, blue one is, uh, blue one is minty, purple one tastes like cabbage. Uh, but because color does have a flavor, it's, easy when you're when you're talking about food aesthetics especially food marketing it's very easy to think that what you're doing is confusing our senses by uh saying that red is always spice or something like that but a matter of fact it's a it's a psychosomatic reality that if something is a different color it will taste a different color it's something that you have to consider when you're designing food it's not something that uh, is really an afterthought now this is an example that you can use on plates. So food on plates, as you can see, the green plate looks in a certain way, the black plate looks in a certain way, the blue plate and the white plate looks in a certain way. We can do a small exercise if anyone wants to do it. Does anyone want to be a part of my exercise? Yes? So tell me about the white plate. Um, it looks healthy. Which is the most expensive one? Uh, you say the... Black. Black. black one's the most expensive because we said black is elegant, right? Which is what's the cheapest one? Blue. And there's even a dish in the US called Blue Plate Special, which is cheap. Which is the healthiest one? White or green? Green. Green? Green. Green, white, white. Why is white more healthy? Because it's cleaner. Makes sense. It also actually has more green in it than the green plate. So there you go. Just proving my point, really. Okay, now the more technical things about human to food interaction, not only the visual. From a technical human to food interaction, the way that we pick up food and the way that we eat affects how you, how you, eat, how you eat the food, and especially with packaging. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And obviously the difference between the fork and the chopsticks. There's this very old Jerry Seinfeld joke. You're familiar with Jerry Seinfeld? There's an old Seinfeld joke, and he says, it's not a very good joke. He says, um, surely the Chinese at this point have seen forks. So why do they still use a chopstick? And the audience laughs. But what he take, fails to take into account is that the chopstick is actually perfectly suited and 100% better for eating Chinese food than a fork will ever be. A fork is a, is a clumsy, is for stabbing things and cutting things. They're designed entirely different. You can never serve a steak in a, in a Chinese restaurant unless you cut it up into pieces. And if you give somebody uh, some Cantonese stir fry with a fork, they will have a lot of difficulty eating. So the two, the two things are completely connected. Back to Pringles. So 
if your food package is a certain shape, it will define how somebody eats it. So if you go to the very top, if your package is just this size of thing, then you just eat it out with your fingers. It's easy. If it's a little bit bigger, you will need a tool to go down in there. You will need a spoon or, or a fork or a chopstick to get in there and get your thing. And if it's even further down, you have to tilt the package to get it out. And then in order to get the stuff at the bottom, you have to pour it, pour it out or get your hand stuck in the, in the Pringles thing, I guess. But you, sh you should pour it out. And so this is a basic rule, which is the, the wider it is with a, with a width increase, so does eatability increase. With a width decrease, pourability increases. It's an inverse law. These are the two exact same foods. One is in a wide package, one is in a skinny package. This one people will take out and put on a plate, unless they don't have any plates. And this one people will eat out. And they look very different. The other test that you do in food, uh, in food design and package development is where people are going to be eating the food. The desk test is if you get something delivered to your desk and you eat it at your desk without it going all over, going all over you or all over your computer. The bench test is can you get it from a cafe and go sit on a bench and eat it? And then the car test is only done in the United States. And it's if you can eat while not even looking at the food and driving a, a motor vehicle at high speed. Um, and this is like, no, but it's something you have, you do in food design in the United States. So if someone, if a, if a fast food company came to, came to a food designer and said, I want to design a new salad wrap, you have to do the car test to see if somebody can eat your salad wrap with one hand while, well, no, it's, it's manual, <laughs> automatic cars there. So that's actually why I think they have automatic cars because they eat. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you have to design it so it doesn't go all over you when you're driving and you don't crash the car. And then the question is if you're a chef, does it spill? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. This is also why all our cars have cup holders. Okay. So now there's back to the theory real quick. It's kind of a, a combination of all of these is the food technical, the, the color theory of food, the industrial design of food, all, come, all can be understood in a way that we bring it all together in a social theory. And the social theory that we're using as an example is this uh, essay by Walter Benjamin called Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. If you're familiar with this one, didn't think you would be, so I'm going to explain it really quick. Um, basically, Art in the age of mechanical reproduction is the invention of the photograph changed the way we look at art, right? We have all seen many, many uh, beautiful works of art, but we don't know, we've never been to the place where the, where the art is not. This uh, Caravaggio, this book, Botticelli, sorry. Uh, this Botticelli, uh, Venus and Mars is very famous, but really this painting is not famous. She is famous, this, this image. You have seen this image more than you have seen this. Image. And the reason you have seen the, her face more than you have seen this is because the museum where this hangs, they made a postcard of her face and they sold it. They took pictures and they sold it. They printed it in magazines. And this is what mechanical reproduction can do to art. Mechanical reproduction can be thought of as a democratizing force to let everyone be access to some beautiful Botticelli, uh, or it can remove what Benjamin calls the aura of the, of the art. So if you look at these, we've all seen these, right? But I have never, I've been to the Louvre a few times, but there's a huge line for people to Go and see the Mona Lisa. So I never go and see the Mona Lisa because I don't need to have seen the Mona Lisa. I know what it looks like. We all know what the Mona Lisa looks like. And, we, and these are all very famous paintings, right? This exactly. This is aura. So this is what Benjamin calls aura. If Benjamin says, if you go to a museum, well, yeah, okay. If you go to a museum and you have to fight a hundred tourists to see the the, uh, the Mona Lisa, you're probably going to appreciate it. If you have to go to uh, another famous museum to go and see the painting that's hanging there in the room that is specially designed for it. And if you go back in time a little bit more to a good example here in Catalonia is these, this is a Romanesque church in the Val de Boy. And the Val de Boy has five or six Romanesque uh, churches that are the best example of Romanesque painting uh, and architecture in the world. And they were lost. I don't know how you could lose a church, but they discovered them in, uh, in, this, in the 60s or 70s, uh, where they had been for hundreds of years, obviously, uh, being used as churches. So I don't know how they discovered them. But anyway, so they say they discovered them at this point. And they had all these murals on them. And if you go to the churches, you can see the murals. And the mural is inside an exactly created vestibule. You have to go to the Val de Boy, which is like three hours away. It's in Leda. I recommend going there. It's very beautiful. Uh, you can go ski. You go there. You have to hike through mountains. You go to the place. You find it. You see this like. Uh, 
uh, beautiful Romanesque villa. Or you can go to the National Museum of Catalan Art, where they took the frescoes using a technology, plaster cast it, and they took it off the wall and they put it onto another, another vestibule and put it in this museum. But if you go to this museum, they have a huge hall of Romanesque, Romanesque frescoes that are super beautiful, like the first four or five. They have like 20 from all around Catalonia, especially the Valdeboy. And that is, if you want to understand what aura is, the best way to understand aura is to go to Valdeboy and see one fresco in a church and then go to the Museum of Art Catalonia and see a hundred frescoes in, a, in the bottom of a museum. It's a very different experience. Right? So how do we apply this to food? This is an example of one, by the way. It's the most famous one in, in the Museum of Catalonia. So how do we apply this to food? If you apply this to food, first of all, you have to remember that conspicuous consumption and food as an object and food as a food as a way of a way of conveying social status, as well as a way to surprise, delight, and entertain, has existed for centuries. This is the, the Han Imperial Feast, is a very famous like thousand course meal, sorry, eight thousand course meal uh, that was done in the Han Dynasty. And this is an example of a medieval banquet where you would do in the medieval banquet is you would get a huge ostentatious uh, swan stuffed with a goose with a pig sewed to it or something, and you would eat it and everyone would watch you eat it and be in awe of you eating it. Um, but the same thing was in, in the Han Dynasty is you'd have the main court officials eating the fancy food that's like a piece of sculpture that probably doesn't taste very good. Uh, and everyone is watching them and being like, wow, I wish I could eat that. Uh, and so you probably see where this is going. This is after a quick history of restaurants to understand where we're going to understand the idea of aura within restaurants, is the reason we have restaurants now is because mostly in Europe is because of the French Revolution. Because you had a bunch of aristocrats and the aristocrats were the only people who could afford, afford cooks. And all the aristocrats had cooks who cooked amazing delicious food for them and nobody else had cooks. Then the aristocrats all got killed. So the cooks needed a job and they opened restaurants in France. That's why France is kind of the home of the restaurant in Europe. And one of the most famous is the, the Tour d'Argent where you go, you get like a certificate for your duck. They have a, a duck, they crush it in an apple press and make a sauce out of the blood. It's very theatrical. Uh, there's Cellar Juan Roca, uh, Cellar Can Roca, where you, you have to go, you go to Girona, you go in, it's a beautiful vegetable, super lovely architecture, et cetera, et cetera. All this food has an aura. So can food have an aura in the same way art can? I think for sure. Uh, this is an old pub. This is Pushkin Cafe. And this is, an example, this is from uh, someone wrote an article that they went to Cafe Pushkin once, and he says, it was like I was eating in a museum because it is like you're eating a museum. The food itself has an aura to it. It has an understanding. It's why you can, you can use Benjamin to talk about food because food also has an aura. Now, does food here in Catalonia have an aura? A good example, and what I would encourage you to do is to go to this place in Dos Rios, uh, which is one of the best restaurants ever. So you have to drive there. It's in the middle of the Corredor Mountains in Maresme, you know where that is? So you should drive there, go to Dos Rios, you see the outside, you see the inside, you see the food. The food has an aura and an understanding to it. It doesn't photograph very well because the lighting is terrible uh, because it's a, it's a masia. And the food is the same, the same typical food you would get in a cafe across the street, probably a little bit uh, better. But the reason I say probably a little bit better is because I had to drive to Dos Rios. I had to, get, I had to go to this thing. I'm trying to take a picture. There's an old lady cooking it, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of stuff is the aura of food. So a good way to understand aura in food, go to the Valdeboy, Boy, go to the, uh, go to the National Museum of Catalonia, then for lunch, go to the Corridor Mountains. Be a nice trip. Now, food in the age of digital reproduction, in the same way that the photograph, uh, Benjamin would say, has removed food from its idea of aura and, uh, and its place and its place in time. Uh, Benjamin is a little bit of a conservative in this way. He doesn't like it. He's not happy that the photograph exists. I'm quite happy the photograph exists. I'm glad that we're all able to see, we're all able to see the Mona Lisa. And the same way chefs get the same way about food and Instagram. They're not happy that people take pictures of Instagram. They don't like to see people take pictures of the food because it's not, we're not the pure, it's not the pure enjoyment of food. You're not doing it properly. That's not how you're supposed to enjoy the food. Well, you can enjoy food however you like. And this is examples of, uh, of how food, digital reproduction within food has not only changed the way we interact with food, but change the way how we interact with food on a non-physical level, on a completely digital level. We are interacting with food in a totally different way. It's influenced the design of restaurants. Restaurants now have better lighting. There's some examples here. 
actually, let me let me show you these examples because they're quite cool. So this is a restaurant in St. Petersburg where they just stick stuff on top of milkshakes. Uh, there's her with her, her milkshake. This is a place that does just checkerboard things in, in DC. They focus on, not in DC, NYC. They focus just on a checkerboard thing. This is a cafe called Carthage Must Be Destroyed, uh, by which, I don't know, again, it's an interesting name. Anyway, all of their stuff is pink. That's their thing. Everything's pink. You can get anything you want as long as it's pink. Then this is a cafe in London, which just sells clear alcohols in teacups with stuff written on the bottom so that you can take a picture. And then the design of these things, you can see. It's, this is a fashion cafe in NYC. This is in Korea. This one's also in Korea. This one is in Korea as well. You have, you have uh, sheep, so you can take a picture of the sheep. Uh, this, is the, this is a bar in New York. But you're seeing, you're seeing what I'm talking about here. Is all of these are restaurants, right? Restaurant, 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 restaurant. But the primary, the primary driver for these restaurants, the reason people go to these restaurants is so that you can get a nice picture taken and you can take a picture of your food, which I have to stress is a valid way of enjoying food. That's how you want to enjoy food. Enjoy food this way. And no judgment, uh, but just interesting. And then these two here are from a place called the Museum of Ice Cream in New York, which takes it one step further, which actually removes food from the equation altogether and just makes props that you can take pictures with. So they make props of ice cream that you can go and get your picture taken with a prop of ice cream. Then you don't have to worry about eating that huge milkshake because that's a burger on top of a milkshake. That's a lot of calories. So you can just go and you just get your picture taken. This is Katie Perry in a swimming pool full of ice cream uh, sprinkles, for example. But it's still informing the way we are influenced and we are influencing food. Each influencer, right? One more. These are kind of examples of how restaurant design changes based on this. All of these are from restaurants where the restaurant has been designed primarily as a place to take pictures and eat rather than a place to eat and take pictures, the reverse of the original slide. So you can see the lighting on this tree here, beautiful slide, but it's mostly designed for taking pictures of the tree, not for the food. That's a change that happened in, I would say in the, in the, in the last year. In the, pre, in the year before this, well, you can't really talk about the year before this because of COVID, no one was going to restaurants. So let's talk about 2019, but 2019, uh, most of the, the lighting was very focused down so you could get a good picture of the food. Now what Instagram restaurants are doing is they're really opening up to take pictures of the space they're in. So they're focusing more on the lighting, more on the decor, and more, you see, look at this lighting. Beautiful, lovely. And this restaurant here, these three here, is uh, a restaurant where all the walls are made of grass. And if you look for their location on Instagram, you can't find a single picture of their food, only pictures of people in front of this grass wall. So it's pretty cool. And then these two guys here, you're probably aware of, they, this is uh, the Nusseret Steakhouse. He became very famous because he put salt on, salt on things like this. And he got a huge following on, on Instagram. I don't even eat beef. And I follow him on Instagram and watch him do ridiculous things to beef. It doesn't, it affects the way I think about beef, I think. It affects the way we eat, it affects the way everyone else eats, it affects the way all restaurants eat, is because you have to have this theatrical showmanship to it. So there's this whole subset of mostly Turkish, but it's difficult to tell actually. Do I see more Turkish chefs doing this because the algorithm gives them to me? Or do more Turkish chefs do this? I don't know the answer. And this guy here makes comically large food. That's what he does, he just makes huge food. And his, his channel is, in fact, a really great way of learning about Turkish cuisine because everything is so big, you can identify exactly what he's doing. So if you want to learn how to make a kebab, you're like, okay, he's putting a kilo of rosemary in there. I'll probably put a little bit. And it's very useful. But again, I, I, I doubt if you go to his restaurant, he's serving you a 10 kilo burger. Uh, I doubt it. But it would be cool if it was. Then to move it from a back one level further. We've gone from food as a restaurant as a place to be seen, restaurant as a place to take a picture of the food, restaurant as a place to get your own picture taken, to a restaurant as an entirely digital experience, dining exclusively online, where what we are eating, and we don't even have to be in this place, because we can experience it from a fully digital, digital way. And the two examples I've chosen to illustrate that are Mukbang, or Mukbang, uh, and Noma in Mexico. Mukbang, if you guys are familiar with it, is basically watching someone eat an absurd amount of food uh, with volume, ter volume turned up. Uh, and it's, an in it's, it's a very digital experience. You're sitting, you're watching someone eat it. It's, uh, it's an interesting way of uh, associating with food, but it's primarily digital. Nobody, I think, watching Mukbang 
would say, that sounds good. I'm going to go get a thousand chicken wings and, enjoy, and have it with this lady. <laughs> or I'm going to get a, a, a soup bowl full of noodles and, and do it at the same time as this lady. Nobody does that. And it comes with all of the baggage that all of this always comes where serious food people tend to look down on these kind of social interactions uh, online of uh, people, particularly non-Western people, uh, doing silly things with food. And the West likes to be like, oh, look, that's so, that's, that's so funny. Uh, but it's a, it's again, it's a, it's a different way of dealing with food. But the West loves stuff like Noma, which is also an entirely digital experience. Noma went to Mexico. They started a restaurant in the, in the middle of the mine jungle. They made their own plates. They made their own uh, tables, et cetera, et cetera. They filmed it all for the internet. And then they opened it for like a week week and a half, and nobody got to go because one, it's crazy expensive. Two, they wanted to let locals go, which is admirable, but that brought the number of available tickets down to five, and then there's a finite amount of food critics in the world, and they almost go. So basically just food critics went to this restaurant and took pictures of the food, and we got to watch the food critics eat the food that Noma made, which I would argue is exactly the same as watching this kind of excess. This is excess in the way of having a mountain of chicken wings. This is excess in the way if you have to go to the Maya jungle and you're watching the whole, whole thing go down. But both of them are united by the fact that they are primarily digital experiences of dying. They're not, they're not, you would never, you can never go to Noma, Mexico and you, I hope, will never eat as much food as this lady. Noma's originally in Copenhagen. originally in Copenhagen, yes. But this was their project where they went to Mexico to do this, uh, to do this thing. Now, that was kind of the fun part. Does anyone have any questions about the fun part, theoretical part? Art theory, color theory, Instagram? No? Okay, tell me. Well, I have a question. I'll, 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 I'll two questions from the previous section from the history. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one was, how did we fix iron deficiencies before we had, we had the iron age? And, and I, and how did we fix iron deficiency before the iron age? Yeah. You didn't, people died. Yes. We didn't, we didn't have, we didn't and also on the GMOs, you know, in order to combat this Monsanto monopoly, is there a way to, is, are, are there any initiatives that you know of that are, let's say, open source GMO uh, initiatives? Or no, because it take, takes a huge amount of money to do, to do genetic modification. So it's, it's in the hands of this very small, uh, very small uh, group of companies. I mean, you could nationalize Monsanto. Okay, now the less fun part. These are the, these are the current problems that are facing us within the food system. That technology, I think, can help and should help and will help. Basically, food hunger, worker exploitation, and climate change. To talk about food waste, to understand food waste, when we talk about food waste, is a third of all food produced globally is wasted. Um, and of that, 100%, the stuff that's not wasted, most of it goes towards livestock. And we, as humans, get a very small amount, something like less than 30%. Most of it's for feeding cows or going in the, going in the garbage. This is um, developed countries do this. Developed countries do this because they've said uh, they don't want to, if they, if they cannot sell all the food, they just get rid of it or they waste it. So most food waste happens on an agricultural level. And it's important to understand this when you're talking about food waste. Because oftentimes when people talk about food waste, they come up with really wonderful ideas to reduce food waste in the home, to reduce food waste through for fermentation, for example, or to reduce food waste through uh, ordering less or eating less or that kind of thing. New types of fridges that keep food longer and better. But if the reality of food waste is it's all happening on, in, on the agricultural level. If you want to solve food waste, you have to solve it on an agricultural level. It's very nice. It's not, if you want to reduce food waste at your house, you should. It's wonderful and it's rewarding. Fermenting things is a lot of fun. But if you don't answer the agricultural question, no. So you can see here the individual waste, mostly agriculture, mostly grocery stores, because if they cannot sell it or if it goes past the sell by date, they will throw it away and that kind of thing. There's, a, um, there's an interesting story that when it was, when was it? 2017 now, there was a big trade dispute between China and the United States. And China buys 150% of all the United States corn that it sells. Most or not corn, so, uh, soybeans. Most soybeans in the United States are sold and produced into ethanol, but the ones that are produced for food are sold to China for eating. And because of this trade dispute, they couldn't sell the soybeans. They had these like silos, tons of soybeans just going bad. And if they had just thought to process it into 
miso or turn it into soy sauce or do something with it, we would have had a bunch of free miso for but they couldn't do it and it just went bad. And so that's, that's food waste more or less. So how can, how can technology help food waste? There's an interesting way of thinking about it. So if you think about the developed world's food, uh, food output as one kind of large centralized farming practice, if you look at the United States and Europe, it's basically one, especially in the United States, it's basically three farms own 90% of the farmland in the US. And that's a centralized, centralized agricultural operation, really, really huge farms. And this is to make an interesting comparison. If you think about China in prior to 1980, and if you think about the United States now, there's a lot of very similar things happening in terms of uh, agriculture and centralization. So a brief history of China in the 1980 is the agriculture of China in 1980 was collectivized. There was no, you weren't allowed to do any individual farming and because you weren't allowed to do any individual farming, uh, the grain, there wasn't very much grain output. And then in 1982, Deng came along and Deng basically uh, broke it into smaller pieces and allowed individual farms to, to make their own grain and sell their own grain. And the result is, as you can see here, is this is, this is like, uh, this is grain production, this is cultural revolution, very forward, this is Deng. Um, it's huge output of uh, grain production just by decentralizing. So if you want to create more grain, that's a good way of doing it. If you want to give more grain to people, it should be in smaller community farms that, uh, I say community, I could mean Catalonia, uh, farms that give more grain to everybody to stop it food waste. Or you can invest heavily in logistics and technology and ship your food all over the world, refrigerate your food all over the world, but that requires giving away free food, which is, a, you have to, you have to overcome this obstacle at some point. Otherwise, you're just going to continue wasting food. That's the fundamental problem with food waste. And to talk about current events real quickly about food waste is how could the Indian, the current Indian uh, agricultural issues that are happening, how will that create food waste if, if certain things happen? Right? This is a future, future thing. So the current, the current strike on India's uh, farm workers, which I'm sure you've all heard about, um, is mostly because of the removal of the state's uh, state agreed prices for farms. They say the farmer used to be able to sell an onion for, for X, X amount, and the state's saying, okay, we're going to remove that. We're going to let a free marketplace decide, which means they're not going to be able to make any money off of these, uh, these selling their crops, which means they're going to collapse. It means they're going to be bought by large farms. It means those large farms are going to get to uh, produce basically monocultures and huge amounts of crops doing one huge farm, which is exactly what happened in the United States. Uh, they're going to create artificial scarcity, which is exactly what happens again in the United States. And then you end up with a whole bunch of food waste. So India actually only has something like 10% to 20% food waste compared to uh, 30% in the US, much less. And the reason for that is because they have, they have decentralized, uh, decentralized farming practices. So the other thing that is a problem with the current food system is the worker exploitation. The entire food system is built on the backs of labor that is like miserable, terrible, awful labor. If you want to talk about Spain, you can see the satellite picture here. That's the, the plastic sea in the south of Spain, which is where it's mostly migrant workers picking all of the food that we eat on a daily basis, all of the vegetables, and they're not uh, paid properly and it's terrible working condition. Then you have cooks, which again, are just doing massive processing work. We think of cooking now as kind of a cool, fun, sexy profession, but that's for the chefs that are on TV, not so much for the, the chefs that are cooking in the, in the restaurants and kitchens we are all going to normally. Uh, certainly not in any fast food establishment or in any food factory. And then also delivery workers who I believe were just on strike like a week ago. They probably explained why it sucks being a delivery driver. And the only solution to this is to automate and to not have these jobs exist anymore. That's very easy, well, not easy, but I think a very necessary solution. And there it is. Um, this is what we do, this guy. <laughs> Then, if you want to fight climate change, there are several food related issues. The biggest one that we're always told about is single use packaging, but single use packaging should be taken into account with everything else. The fertilizer could be fixed with genetically modified plants, for example. The single use packaging could be simply that. If you could create new packaging, you could create more compostable packaging. This is food design problems and food design solutions. The food design, this is the point of food design, is one, to make food fun and exciting and enjoyable and to take pictures of, etc., but also to affect change within the society by making things easier to do. So you can change packaging, you can stop doing palm oil, and then the massive amount of land that's used for cows is a big problem with climate change as well. 
And so the basic idea here is if you take this, you take a technological view here, and technology enables us to get here to combine all of these things into a into a reasonable socially uh, ecological place. And that's it. That is my talk on food technology. Maybe more about yourself and also um, the work you do right now for the startup. Sure. So I am a food, I'm into food theory, obviously. Uh, and I do the research and development at Remy. And what that means for culinary research at Remy. And what that means is we create dishes using all of these, all of these ideas and all of these processes that we want to sell to people and to give to people um, in such a way that uh, we are able to solve some of these problems that we're talking about. So basically my day-to-day -day work is creating food for robots. Because if you try to create food for robots using the same logic that you do creating food for humans, this, uh, you will not have any success. Robots are fundamentally different and food should be designed for robots. In the same way that the bread was made square because the train's ovens were square, we need to make the food in a different way for the robot to use it. We have to let technology work for us. And to allow technology to work in this way, we need to design the food around the world. And that's fundamentally, that's what I do. Is I, I make food for people. Can you explain us uh, what the innovation is of the startup and what made you move from New York to Barcelona? Ah, well, I moved to New York to Barcelona, one, because I like Barcelona a lot. And two, because I really like this company, Remy. And I think, I, I think, Again, as I've been talking about, the main driver for societal change has to come from technology. So my belief in technology and the technology's ability to change the world in a positive way is why I wanted to find a food technology startup that was aligned with my values and give all my energy to help me. So in practice, could you explain, like I've been to the dark kitchen. Like I don't think a lot of people know what the dark kitchen is. Could you a little bit explain? Oh, yeah. Sure, a dark, a dark kitchen is a kitchen that operates, you're familiar with Glovo, I suppose? Yeah. Glovo, you can order many different foods. A dark kitchen is one kitchen in a space. It's not a restaurant. It's not a public place you can go into. And it's many, either many, many different restaurants uh, or one, let's say, kitchen providing food for many different virtual restaurants. And so if you were to order a burrito and uh, sushi, then they would be prepared by the same person and sent out to the same person. And the thing about dark kitchens is because the well, kitchen work in general is because the it's a lot of preparation for a very small amount of peaks, but you still need someone there for the low for the low peak uh, hours. It's not a very good job, and they're called dark kitchens because they're dark. Because it's not open to the public, it doesn't have to be nice. Because it's not open to the public, it doesn't have to be in a good area. It can be in the basement of a of a shed, in like some super dark conditions. As long as it has a vent, one person will be there cooking all the burritos for global, uh, and that's what a dark kitchen is. It's basically a decentralized kitchen that you're not supposed to see. And so one of our goals is to automate dark kitchens, is to remove this worker from this bad environment. Great. And so we have one dark kitchen now in, uh, in Barcelona, it's operating, and soon we will have one. Um, so I basically spent the mo majority of 2019 and 2020 trying to start some, some startup that helps the, the back end issue, the agriculture issue of um, food waste and the environmental impact. But I want to know, I want to hear from you. I didn't really get anywhere there, but in your view, what's the most exciting technology right now and innovation right now that is addressing the environmental impact of agriculture? Yeah. I think from an agricultural standpoint, there's a lot of technology companies that are doing uh, robotic farming, robotic harvesting, uh, especially. We went to a company in Girona, actually, that does cider. No, they make, no, well, they do make cider. You're right. They make cider and perry. And they have a little, like, they're working on this uh, robot to, to pick the to pick the apples because you have to pop, pick an apple when it's a certain correct size, temperature, place, time, and it can identify with computer vision and pull it off. And these kind of more advanced harvesters, rather than when you think of a robot harvester, you think of a combine harvester, right? Like a massive machine that just drives through an uh, entire, rips up a whole field. Uh, the more subtle, like co-working robots that are able to make better informed decisions rather than because if you were to use the old combine harvester method in an orchard you would just level the orchard and pull the pull the apple back which you can't do. i think that kind of stuff is more interesting than 
uh, huge automation for a massive field of rice, particularly because of this, is that you need more diversity in order to fight climate change. You need more uh, climate diversity of different rice crops, of different uh, crops in, in general. And if you're using the old school technological approach, which is a massive machine that sucks everything up, you're not going to be able to get this kind of diversity without relying on extensive human labor. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, about the uh, this new technology of um, meat, uh, meat grown midla. Oh, yeah. uh, do, do you have any hopes uh, for it to solve the problems that you have mentioned? And how are you working, uh, or have you tried to work on this at Brahmi Robotics, or any, or have you engaged in, with it in any of your projects? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've worked. Well, lab grown meat is is not. It's currently not legal to sell yet because it's not been stamped but there are some a lot of interesting startups doing it growing it from a cellular level uh which i think is interesting it's not at the level yet where we can produce enough for um the amount of money that it would cost to get one steak um but it's an interesting technology i think the plant-based meat that you do with co-extruders which is what impossible meat is or beyond work they don't grow it from a cellular level they extrude it. uh they extrude it an extruder is like a like a tube that pushes out something and a more complex extruder, many, many tubes that push out different materials and different uh, thicknesses, textures, densities. And that's basically what impossible meat is, is many extruders extruding complicated things. It's like a 3D printer. You guys know what 3D printer is. It's like a very, very complex 3D printer that doesn't actually 3D print anything, it's shoots. And uh, that's what plant-based meat is and impossible meat. And I think that stuff is super interesting, and super valuable because we do need to stop eating as much meat as we do. It's, uh, it's a meat should be a celebration food it's become an everyday food. Have you tasted it? Yeah. yeah. The, the cellular meat. It's uh it's meaty, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's um it's like it has the if you were to compare it to a not good steak, that's <laughs> it's well it's it has the, it has all it ticks all the boxes, right? But if you think about how complex a, a cow is, right? What what grass it is eating when it's growing up, what kind of grass its mother was eating, what the climate is like there, how much it's exercising, all affects the different forms and shapes and then taste and flavor of the, of the meat. And in the lab, they can currently, currently they grow it, in a, but what you're tasting more is the, is as if a cow, there's an old physics joke where every physics problem is about a spherical cow in a vacuum, because it makes things so much easier if the cow, if you say a cow is on, on the planet, but it's a spherical cow, so it's not acted on by any outside forces in the vacuum, so nothing's hidden. The steak is like, the lab grown steak is like the steak from a spherical cow. Well, so you said that uh, for now, the steak is one, so in what time, like for five, ten years, Indistinguishable from one another. I think, well, probably like 10 years for a number. Not so long. We have a huge, we have a huge flavor industry that has specialized in creating flavors and creating mimics of flavors. Um, but the main difference in the flavor industry is we now accept the flavor industry's flavors as the flavor of the object that is represented. So if I were to give you a vanilla bean and vanilla extract, in pill form, and I asked you which one of these was vanilla, you would choose the vanilla extract because that's what you're more familiar with because vanilla beans are expensive and rare, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is the point at when, when it becomes that point, that's when plant-based meat will be more, it requires a cultural change more than uh, an exact mimic. I'm curious to know which is your favorite dish? Favorite dish? A big question. Um, I like dishes that I see. I like dishes that have aura. I like to go to a place and find a place and experience the aura of its of its dishes. I like that butifar and beans dish, for example. That's super tasty. I eat that a lot. Uh, I don't know. Probably beans. I like beans a lot. Not so expensive. <laughs> because you're vegetarian. No, I'm not a bean enthusiast. <laughs> 
<laughs> these are, they're great. They're super delicious. I also recently started growing beans. So I'm, I'm going through a bean phase. <laughs> You drink the beans. With beans, uh, I like I like wine more than beer. I actually, again, if you want to talk about food with a sense of place or food with an aura, uh, the reason if you've ever been on to visit a wine, if you've ever been to like a vineyard and a vineyard tour, it's impossible not to buy the wine at the end of the vineyard tour. It's impossible not to think it's the most delicious wine in the world. You could be at any crappy vineyard and you go there and they're like, look at the sun, look at the grapes, it's amazing. And you taste it, like it's true. Then you get it at some bodega and it's not that good. It's the same wine, but that's the aura. That's the aura behind it. And so I like, I like to, I like Slovenian wine especially because Slovenian wine has this aura about it that is my favorite wine. For example, I forget the name because it's long Slovenian. Wine. It's made in during Yugoslavia. The wine industry was national, and so you had grapes that were grown in Slovenia. You, they were processed in uh, Czech Republic. And they were bottled in Slovakia. And then obviously Yugoslavia collapsed. And you have a bunch of vineyards that are no longer being used by anyone in Slovenia. It used to be government vineyards and they're kind of growing wild since the, since the 90s. And a lot of people have gone in. And grapes are kind of a pest. Once you have grapes, they're always there. So people have gone in and taken these grapes from these vineyards and then pressed them into wine and bottled it and sold it. And it's super, super interesting, super cool. And I like it mostly because of this story and also its taste. I guess the, the color experience as well is important also for how you get satisfaction from food, right? Food means you can have different colors that they satisfy your aura experience in the micro sense. Then you get a better and better satisfaction from the food rather than having food that has only one or two colors. 100 percent That is correct. So the more colors, the better you feel after eating. Well, up until a point. I think the more depending because colors each color interacts with us in a different way, the way we look at it and the way we interpret it. Uh, if you eat a plate of beige food, for example, it's probably not going to be that exciting. And also, if you eat a completely multicolored rainbow, you're going to consider it very artificial. So it's a balance somewhere somewhere within that. Um, and that's it, yeah, it's not it's not just a psychological. It's a psycho and phil physical. It's a psycho and physical uh, thing. Could you walk us through the course that you have in mind here for Harbor Space you know, to use the opportunity for all the students to hear what you have in mind for the course and well, you know, why would it be so exciting to join? Sure. So the idea with the course is basically what I went through in an hour here is to go over it in much more detail. There'll be uh, one part that's all about food technology. How has food technology influenced us? What can food technology do? And we'll focus more on real world examples and uh, companies that are doing X, Y, and Z. And we'll have a experiment at the end where you do archaeology on a food object, on a piece of food technology, and the archaeology of this food, food object or dish. You can then, using the knowledge you've gained from the first part of this class, figure out using uh, both the kind of Foucaultian idea of, of uh, archaeology of knowledge and the food technology that you, that you learn, take apart and understand the history of the time and a place, picking any, any dish you want from any menu. That's one part. The other part is much more of this theoretical, theoretical approach to food, food theory. How has, but focusing mostly on the digital world, right? Mostly about how people interact with food in a digital sense. How do people act with food when they're purchasing food online? How do they interact with food online? How, do, how does online food bring us together or take us apart? Like, how is it different in this community versus that community? That kind of stuff. And then the other one is the, is the much larger social problem issue. It's like, how do we solve simple things like well? That kind of situation. The benefit of it that you will, I guess, uh, show what you do, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's the idea. Is it will connect it all to real world physical examples, possibly not the world. Can, uh, anybody can order uh, right now from Global, right? Your food. Right. Is, yes. This is true. We have two restaurants. It? Two. Yeah. Two. One is called Rebel Ribs, which focuses on ribs, and one. Oh, ribs. Rebel ribs and Rebel. one Rebel ribs, yeah. And one is uh, Alita's de Pollo, um, called the Wings and Co. And actually, we have a third. So, what I would recommend to you, our latest invention, if you want to taste the newest thing that's coming out of Remy, is to order the salmon from this from our kitchen called Remy Kitchen uh, on Global, and that is uses um, more advanced techniques than the previous two restaurants. So I would recommend this. One. Thank you.
Simon, yeah. It's good. Replication. Yeah. It shows up as a replication number four. Yes. Uh, Rebel ribs. Ribs. Wing and cup. And wings and cup. But like I said, the Remy Kitchen is the more, is the one that's like kind of the latest, the latest one. The salmon is just salmon. Just well, salmon. I don't the know brand. what it's called. I don't know. Um, what's salmon in Spanish? Salmon. 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 That's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, we are very lucky. Oh, you have some other. Oh, there was one question in the back. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got a question. So. Uh, in what countries uh, this type of space? Like when, when you work, where you work? Here, here. Barcelona. Here, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know like, a lot of restaurants with the same name in Moscow, right? Like Remy Kitchen and so on. So on. Ah, yes, so there, is, so there is. There is there is a restaurant for Remy Kitchen. Like, uh, we found out the after name of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, we looked, I did a, we did a Google search. Uh -huh. So, and the second point, like, uh, I see all this um, about like centralized uh, system of growing. Uh, uh, some vegetables and so on. So, uh, what was the next step of uh, your startup? You want to like exactly do this farms, or you want to do more specified on uh, dark, uh, dark kitchens? And, uh... No, this I should be clear. This um, is this presentation was much more about the theory and understanding of food. What Remy is doing is specifically answering some of these questions. We're focused. We're focused in Barcelona on food technology. We're not doing anything in agriculture, for example. Uh, we're not doing anything in in, uh, in automating agriculture. But I think it will be interesting like, to try to develop this idea because uh, I would right now I know how uh, we grow uh, all this uh, agriculture and uh, this kind of if the statistic is right, so why not? Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, I don't think it's not not only interesting, but it's, it's vital. Otherwise, we're not going to have a planet. So. Yeah, if we don't address the problems in dark kitchen, we're going to end up with a huge problem on our hands that the cities become entirely reliant on these dark kitchens that are done in a very old fashioned, very, very old fashioned way. It's a huge step backwards. Um, as far from a worker standpoint, from a food standpoint, for providing food for our city, that's a huge step forward. It makes sense. You have a central kitchen that is that is providing food for many, many restaurants and sending it out it makes 100% sense. It's the people working inside the dark kitchen is, is the issue. Um, and it exists, I don't know about in every single country. Uh, I know for sure it's in the US, all over the US, and for sure it's all over Europe. Uh, I know for sure it's in Russia, but I don't know about. Well, a dark kitchen is specifically sending you a physical item, and a museum would be sending you would be sending you information and pictures and images, um, and those exist already. There are virtual museums, uh, and I think they're good. I think they, they lack an aura, but I think that's that's part and parcel of it. And if you design something for consumption online, there's plenty of digital exhibitions and digital experiences that are purely designed for digital in German. And if you went to the actual place, it wouldn't be the same. So I think that already exists. Uh, guys, we have a uh, uh, Roda, and uh, she she's the owner of Flatterby, the Irish bar. And we have some real chicken wings. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years left to eat real meat, so you everybody's welcome. There's there's drinks and food from Flutter Beats. Let's uh <laughs> we have uh, with the food and drinks a chance to ask John sort of you know get to know him. Make sure you guys ask for permission to visit Remy at some point. <laughs> I mean, organized in an organized way. Thank you so much, John. It was super fun to listen to. <laughs> it's always the same. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Maggie, 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 Maggie,